Okay, welcome to week three of our Lenten series. Just want to give you a bit of a heads up this morning, Sue. Uh, at the end of the message today, I'm going to give an opportunity um, that if you've never um, publicly professed your faith in Jesus, there will be an opportunity for you to do that if the Spirit leads you to that place uh, during this morning's service. So let's pray. Almighty God, Lord of life, Lord of second chances, we give you all the glory, the power and the praise for your grace, which invites us to repentance. Lord, when we have intentionally walked down a path that turned our backs towards you and your kingdom, we are sorry. Call us, guide us, direct us back to your ways so that we may walk on your paths in your kingdom come. May the revelations that come from you, Lord God, be those which impact us in positive ways today. May all that comes from me be forgotten. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So if you've grown up in Hobart, this may come as a bit of a shock to you, but one of the trickiest things that I found when um, I moved to Hobart over six years ago now was getting my head around all the one-way streets. Now, I'm mostly okay with things now. I've, I've learnt. But back then, every time I had to drive somewhere around the city, it was an anxiety-inducing experience. Now, I am the sort of person that will check Google Maps before every trip in the car, no matter where I'm going, just to make sure I'm clear. But in 20... 17, I didn't necessarily trust Google Maps because it kept telling me to take the second exit at the roundabout in front of the Bunnings at Glenorchy, which didn't exist. I'm guessing it did, but before I got here. But now, from experience, from, from learning by doing, I know that you go up on Davy and you come down on Macquarie. I'm also pretty good at remembering that you can go both up and down on Collins, that is until you get to Elizabeth, <laughs> and then you can only go down. Likewise Liverpool Street, you can only go up until you get to Harrington, and then you can go both up and down. Bathurst is both ways until you get to Murray Street, and then you can only go down. Well the next one over, Bathurst Street is up and down both ways. Not confusing at <laughs> all. Now, God be praised, I have never accidentally found myself going the wrong way down a one-way street. But you may be surprised how often it happens in Hobart. They turn the corner... And then the driver suddenly notices that everyone is coming towards them. And then they see the look of terror and then anger in the eyes of the oncoming traffic. Pedestrians on the sidewalk have noticed what's going on and, and they just shake their head and roll their eyes and wait for the inevitable panic. The driver in the car with stress rapidly setting in is madly looking for a side street or opportunity to do a U-turn. But the instant they have found safety, the instant that they have turned that car around and are heading in the right direction, they get a sense of relief. They're probably a little shaken and a a touch jumpy and a bit more cautious going forward, but they are glad. They are beyond glad that they are now facing the right direction and have avoided disaster. When we have asked God to show us our sins, our weaknesses, our temptations, to, to show us where we have missed the mark in our living. 
we can feel just as disconnected and panicky as that driver going down the wrong way on a one-way street. And if we ignore the signs, if we assume that it's everyone else around us who is doing the wrong thing, then we begin to put ourselves in danger. Being shown our sin, being confronted by our shortfalls is a mercy. As painful as it can be, it is a gift from God. And repentance is our opportunity to turn things around and go in the right direction. And, as I said before, that is our theme for this morning, the third week of our Lenten series. The last time I was preaching, remember last Sunday I was celebrating my my mum's 70th birthday back in Adelaide, but last time I was here, we were talking about lament. That moment of honest reflection before God speaking and praying transparently about the problems of the world. And more importantly, particularly in this preparation for Easter, reflecting upon our own failures, lamenting our own potential for sin. And so, as the challenge was for this season to fast from that which consumes our time, so that we can go deeper into our relationship with God, we have asked God, to show us our areas of weakness, our areas of temptation, our sinful ways, so that we can move from lamentation to repentance. As we seek through the grace of God and through the power of the Holy Spirit to turn our lives around, to get back on the path that leads towards God and his kingdom. Now, the first words that Jesus speaks according to the Gospel of Mark, the the Gospel considered by most scholars to be the oldest of the four that we have, is found in verse 15 of chapter 1. Now Jesus has been baptised by John, he's been in the wilderness, being tested and tempted for 40 days, and he ends up in the Galilee, and he begins his preaching ministry. And the first words that Mark records Jesus saying in his ministry is this, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. The first thing that Jesus asks for in his ministry is for repentance. However, Jesus was not the first one to make that call, not by a long shot. Before him, we had John the Baptist who was preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. He was starting a renewal movement, the Jordan River, getting the people to come back and begin again. But likewise, he wasn't the first. He was just the next in a long line of God's prophets who were sent to call the people back, to get them to turn away from the idol worship of which they were so fond and come back to the ways of the Lord. In the Old Testament, there are two words which dominate the landscape and will help us get a handle on what it means to repent. The first is this one. It's niham. Say niham. We've got a few words to say this morning. Niham, and it means to turn around, to change your mind in order to find comfort and solace. I like that. Niham. And the second word is a bit harder to say, but give it a go. It is shim vav bet. Shim vav bet. Yeah, say that 10 times. See how you go. And it's used over 600 times in the Hebrew Bible. And it's translated uh, in many different ways, but largely as to turn, to return, to seek, to restore. You'll often see it as the central word in a phrase like, to turn to the Lord with all your heart. Shim Vav Bet. That can be a new password for this week. And then we come to the New Testament and we have the word metanoia. Now this is a compound word, I've spoken about this a long the time, it's one of my favourite words. Breaking into its two bits, meta, it means about, it means beyond, it means after. And noia means to think. 
Ever been told by someone older than you, use your nous, your brain, that's where it comes from. Noia. Metanoia literally means to change your mind, to think again, to go beyond your current pattern of thinking and think something new. You've been thinking one way and metanoia gets you to turn around and think another way. And that's the beginning of repentance, the changing of the mind. But repentance only becomes real when that change of mind leads to a change in action. For example, let's say that me, someone who is not overly comfortable with high places, I'm not so much afraid of heights as I am afraid of falling, but let's just say that I decided I wanted to learn how to skydive. (laughs) And so I go off to skydiving school and I learn about the planes, I learn about the parachute, I learn about the jumps, I learn how to pack my parachute, I learn when to pull the ripcord and I learn how to brace myself for the inevitable fall when I hit the ground. I learn all this stuff. It's all up here. I know it. And then the day arrives. We get all suited up and we get out onto the plane and we're climbing up to those heights. Now, in reality, I'm scared to death. I'm panicking. And at that point, metanoia sets in. I begin to have second thoughts. I begin to question whether I really want to be on the path that I am currently on. But I'm still on a plane. I still have a parachute strapped to my back. All I've done is changed my thinking. And then we get to 7,000 feet and they open the doors and the rush of air comes in and you can see the ground so far below. And at that moment... My metanoia moves from a change of thinking to a change of behaviour as I rapidly back away from the door and go and find a seat. I am not jumping out of a perfectly good airplane, thank you very much. I have changed my mind. I am not following that path. That is repentance from start to finish. A change in thinking that leads to a change in action. Now, in Luke chapter 3, there is a description there about the relationship between repentance and this new action, this new behaviour. It says, this is from the words of John, bear fruits in keeping with repentance. And then we're given some examples of what this fruit actually looks like. We're told anyone who has two shirts should share with one who has none. And anyone who has food should do the same. This means that repenting is what happens inside of us that leads to this new fruit, this new behaviour. Repentance is not the new deed in itself, but it's the inward change that leads to a new outward behaviour. Jesus expects us to experience this inward change so that others would experience our repentance. But of course, the skydiving example, that comes from a place of fear. Fear about jumping out of an airplane. Or we could argue that it's actually repentance coming from common sense, because why would you want to jump out of a perfectly good airplane? But for much of the last century, and largely pretty much only in the last century, repentance has been attached to fear. People have been scared into 
an act of repentance. Maybe you've heard this before. Repent, for the end is near. Repent, or you'll burn. Repent, or something really bad will happen to you. Insert example here. Maybe you've heard a sermon like that. If you have, I'm sorry. That's not right. The number of times the word repent is used to inspire fear and trembling in the name of Jesus makes me wonder how many Christians have fully grasped the scope of God's word. Why so many Christians can tell you what the Ten Commandments are, they can tell you what the greatest commandment is, but they can't tell you what the number one commandment by sheer weight of numbers is in the Holy Bible. Anyone know what it is? Do not be afraid. Do not fear. And all derivatives thereof, the number one commandment by sheer volume in the Bible. So why would you attach repentance to fear? Three hundred and sixty-six times is this commandment in Scripture. As the Irish would say, one for every day of the year and one just because. If I knew I had an Irish accent, that would sound so much better. (laughs) But when Jesus begins his earthly ministry with his call to repent, he is doing so not to try and scare people to change their ways. Instead, he is calling them to repent and believe in the good news because the kingdom of God has come near. He's not saying repent because the end is near. He says to repent because the kingdom of God has come near. If the way your life and your thoughts are heading is not leading you towards God, then maybe it's time to think again. Have another thought. Turn around. Repent. And without fear of missing out, believe in the good news of God's grace through Jesus Christ. Repentance should be an act of faith, not a response to fear. But if we do away with fear as being the primary motivator for repentance, what do we have left? Guilt. Another one of those favourite words in the Christian tradition. Guilt. Paul Tournier, theologian and psychotherapist, said, guilt is a big topic. There is so much to say. And just like the feeling of guilt itself, it is multi-layered. We deal with guilt on an individual level and on a societal level. Guilt is a religious problem, which interests theologians. It's a social problem, which interests sociologists. And it's a psychological problem, which interests psychologists. The Cambridge Dictionary defines guilt as being a noun that means a feeling of worry or unhappiness that you have because you've done something wrong, such as causing harm to another person. Sometimes guilt is genuine. Sometimes guilt is implied. You think you've done something wrong when in fact you haven't. That's a whole other thing we don't have time to go into this morning. But our sense of guilt tends to come from our moral compass, which is shaped by our culture, our family, our faith, and our psychology. For most people, and I say most, it's not everyone, for most people, the idea of stealing makes them feel guilty. Even if it's just you've forgotten to return a pen that you borrowed, or perhaps you didn't scan absolutely everything in your self-service checkout, the awareness of that is enough to cause you to feel guilty. And there are other people who will happily steal a pen, 
happily steal an extra item at the supermarket because they believe themselves to be victims of society. Whether they are a victim or not, this is not victim shaming, but that's their psychology. And so for them, stealing is about justice. It's about making them feel better. That's their moral compass. But either way, let me be clear, stealing is bad, okay? Please put the pens back after the service. Thank you. From the outside, many commentators look at the Christian church and all its shapes and forms and argue that we push too hard on the idea of guilt. That we try to be the fun police. We want to make people feel guilty all the time and we want to negatively impact their mental health. Let's not pretend that there aren't some traditions within the larger Christian church which relish the idea of making sure people know how unworthy we really are and how much like worms we all are. But the problem for the church begins when we leave people in that space. When we leave people feeling guilty, when we leave people feeling shamed without pointing out the path to forgiveness. When anyone in our Christian tradition starts to talk about guilt and shame, when we start to be personally confronted by our sin, as we've asked the Lord to do during this Lent, or when, as Rob so put it last week, by the attitudes of our heart that pull us away from God, when we don't follow those conversations with the immediate revelation that even in our guilt, God has reached down through Jesus Christ to offer us forgiveness, then, and only then, can people label Christians as being guilt mongers. Because positive guilt, even guilt over something small we've done, is an act of hope that leads us to repentance. But far too often, and especially in the modern world today, we are encouraged to suppress guilt. Don't admit that you're wrong. It wasn't your fault. Pretend like nothing is wrong. Deny that you even stepped out of line. But denial of guilt leads to problems. In trying to avoid the pain, the shame and embarrassment of admitting our guilt will make things worse. Personal repentance that comes from guilt is painful. Let's not pretend that it's not. I heard it once described as like hugging a cactus. You get comfort, but it hurts. In Psalm 51, David writes um, about repentance. He's repenting his sexual abuse of Bathsheba and then um, sending her husband off to be murdered. In Psalm 32, David's at it again. He is writing a psalm of lament and repentance. And we're going to sit with this text for a bit this morning. So this is Psalm 32, the first five verses. Happy are those whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Happy are those to whom the Lord imputes no iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. While I kept silent, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me and my strength was dried up as if by the heat of summer. Then... I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not hide my iniquity, and I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Here David exposes what's been happening to him as he sat with his unresolved guilt. Verses 3 to 5 describe the painful process that it took for him to finally come to a place of repentance. He ignored his sin, he pushed it down. He tried to ignore his guilt. 
And he felt as though God's hand was heavy upon him, increasing his discomfort. This is how David describes what is going on for him. Until he finally acknowledges what's going on. He finally acknowledges his unresolved guilt. He acknowledges his sin. He repents and he finds forgiveness. As soon as David confesses, the Lord forgives him. Sometimes when we find ourselves in those moments, carrying something we shouldn't be carrying, we get a sensation of God's silence. And it could be a direct result of our unwillingness to let go and repent. But we can find comfort in knowing that as soon as we humble ourselves, as soon as we let go of that thing we are trying to hide, God in his faithfulness will forgive us. He's promised forgiveness. And the discomfort of David's sin wasn't some abstract spiritual experience, but something that was manifesting itself to him uh, in his emotional state and also his physicality. He felt physical pain, discomfort. He couldn't sleep. He was wasting away. Has guilt ever eaten you? Have you ever had those experiences? The psychosomatic and physical struggle was an example of God allowing guilt to manifest itself. So writes Derek Kidner in his uh, commentary on the Psalms. He also writes, the book of Job is a strong reminder that not all suffering is a result of sin, nor does sin necessarily lead to suffering. However, that does not mean that sin never leads to suffering. And in the case of the psalmist, he, had, he believes it did. He believes his suffering had a divine purpose. David's repentance brought spiritual healing and relief for his whole being. When he confessed his sin, when he verbalised his guilt, when he let go of what he was carrying, the burden was lifted. I want to share with you a story that I heard recently um, on one of John Dixon's Undeceptions podcasts that I've been binging recently. It was the year 1995, April. Englishman Clive White claimed that he had caught a giant rainbow trout weighing in an impressive 16.6 kilos, or if you need the old stuff, 36 pounds, 14 ounces. He'd been visiting a trout farm in Hampshire, a trout fishery, sorry. And after getting, getting his fish checked and weighed, it became a world and UK record. Mr. White, he went on to become somewhat of a fishing celebrity, even appearing on the cover of Trout Fisherman Monthly. I've been told it's a big deal. <laughs> However, in 2003, some eight years later, he wrote the following letter to Mr. David Rowe, the secretary of the British Fish Record Committee, the BFRC. Dear David Rowe, I, Clive White, would like to take this opportunity to withdraw my claim to the BRFC in connection to the record rainbow trout that I caught. I did not catch the fish. I am very sorry and deeply regret what I have done, but I cannot live a lie anymore as it has destroyed my marriage and it very nearly destroyed me. As a result, I have now given up fishing altogether. I know a lot of people will take a dim view of what I have done, but now I can sleep at night, knowing I have nothing to hide. I feel sorry for the people I have cheated out of a genuine record claim. I only hope people will respect me for coming clean and telling the truth. Yours sincerely, Clive White. In the many interviews that followed this revelation, Clive explained how the con was done. And that story actually changed, depending on how you Google the story. But what he did keep saying over and over again was that his confession 
was like a weight had been lifted off him. When we sin, when we miss the mark of godly living, that guilty feeling is our conscience. And it's the work of the Holy Spirit that makes that feeling, that takes it from just a little prick of conscience to bring about conviction. One of the jobs of the Holy Spirit is to bring conviction of sin. Jesus tells us this in John chapter 16, verse 8. And when he, that is the Holy Spirit, comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. That feeling of guilt, the conviction that we feel we've done something wrong, that is the Spirit's invitation to repentance. Repentance is a change in how I think that leads to a change in how I live. When you really change your mind about something, it will change how you think about it, how you talk about it, how you feel about it, and how you act about it. True repentance is more than just a mental exercise. Repentance is a decisive change in direction. It's a change of mind that leads to a change of thinking, that leads to a change of attitude, that leads to a change of feeling, that leads to a change of values, that leads to a change in the way you live. If you want to see how that works in Scripture, when you get home this afternoon, grab your Bibles and open up Luke 15 and read the parable of the forgiving father you'll see the steps of repentance played out in the life of the prodigal son who makes mistakes, who experiences guilt, who comes to his senses, who thinks again, who turns his life around and goes to the Father and experiences forgiveness. When Peter preached the truth about Jesus Christ in Acts chapter 2, he left thousands of his listeners wondering what they should do next. The response he gave in verse 38 is simple. He said, repent and be baptised, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And we're told that as a result, 3,000 were added to their numbers that day. Does it seem strange that Peter said, repent and not believe? Scripture often uses these two concepts together, as Jesus stressed in Mark chapter 1. Repentance and belief are the two sides of the same coin. Both are essential for salvation and each is dependent upon the other. You can't repent without faith and you can't have a living faith without genuine repentance. But in terms of our salvation, you can't separate faith and and repentance To be saved, you must place your faith in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. That decision requires a change of mind. A repentance. About the way you live your life. About who's in charge of your life. And both happen at the same time. Yet many people believe that they must repent before they make a decision for Jesus. Repentance doesn't mean that we must completely change our ways and clean ourselves up so that we can can be worthy to receive Jesus. There should be no delay or separation between repentance and faith. If you have been holding off making a decision for Jesus until you think that you are ready, until you think that you are worthy enough And so you think that your life is completely in order and you've been waiting in vain. Jesus is ready to receive you the moment you change your thinking and turn around. If you feel like your life has been headed the wrong way down a one-way street, Jesus is calling you to stop. Turn around. Repent. 
and believe in the good news. Amen. Now, there is something in your life that needs changing. If you do need to repent, then as Wayne leads us around the table a little bit later on this morning, that is a great opportunity to do that. But if you have never taken the first step, if you have never asked Jesus to come into your heart, to turn to him for repentance, then today is as good as any other day to do that. During the singing of our last song, if you would like to, if you've made that decision, come forward and stand next to me. I'd love to pray for you. If you're still thinking about it, if you're still not there yet, reflect upon the words of the song. And you can come and talk to me at any time about that experience. So as we close, let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you for your forgiveness and for your grace. We thank you for the life of Jesus, whose divine presence and sacrifice for us opened the door to eternal life. We thank you that Jesus is calling us to bring our sorrows and to trade them for joy. Empower us to leave behind our regrets and mistakes, because in you, Lord, there's no reason for us to wait. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.